Thank you for the reminder. Um, what we teachers uh, like, and you might wonder, is to learn things, because that is uh, one of the things that uh, we find very valuable. And the most, uh, the nicest thing is when we learn something from the students. And I can show you what we learned. This is not on the on the website. Let's have a look. Let's put that away. No, just a second. I must be in this. No. No, I am messing up stuff. Ah, where is my screen? That is. Ah, that is this one, yes. And then what I wanted to see is actually what you're already looking at. Um, on my left hand monitor, I can see what you should see. And that is this, this graph. And from this graph, we learned that students actually like deadlines because this is the statistics that students, uh, students produced about uh, handing in stuff for PSC1. And you see there were a few deadlines in the beginning and there was a, what, um, a, a more stringent deadline in the middle at week si uh, six or seven, I think. But we also had a new deadline at the end of the semester. That is the deadline that all students had to meet to be allowed into the assessment. And we see that now we have 80% of the students that are reaching that deadline. So having a deadline is nice. And because we learn of that of you, we'll give you more of them. So we'll give you, simply give you more deadlines to work with, uh, to work against. Actually, what we will be doing is giving you a deadline every two weeks to hand in the stuff of, uh, of the previous weeks. We'll see that uh, uh, again when we uh, look into the module description. So that is the next thing I would like to show. Um, yeah, yes. And the next thing that is I'm going to show is this uh, website. In here you find the up-to-date module description. You will also find it on Connect, by the way, and you find the link to this page. So if you're lost, uh, look at uh, Connect or maybe later on Canvas that will link to this stuff. And the first thing you would look, like to look at is the module description. If, if I make this uh, full screen, there's a lot of uh, text on here, in here. The most important part is in the small text or in the uh, the small letters and that is about the assessments and the rules for assessments. First of all we have two exams in this module. One is a written exam, the theory of Java and programming and testing and it's th second is your practical work and that's what we do in a performance assessment. The newest year st uh, students uh, missed the experience of having a performance assessment. Those students that missed the deadline will still have the experience uh, of having a uh, performance assessment in April somewhere. Uh, that's at least what we expect. And these uh, two parts in the course have, to have a different weight. Uh, the written exam has a weight of 40% and the performance assessment has a weight of 80%. Uh, sorry, 60% because otherwise it wouldn't add up. And there are a few things that have to do with uh, the 45 credit rule. So you can get uh, credits for uh, both parts uh, separately, but you only pass PLC2 if you have both of these, um, of these parts. Uh, and then the important thing is that we will only allow you into a performance assessment when you have done your preparation properly. And that means that you should have made all the exercises. Making all the exercises um, in time, that is by a shorter deadline, is also beneficial because you will get one uh, a tenth of a point for each uh, meeting of the deadline. So we have uh, 12 weeks in total, and if you are complete for uh, a week, then you get uh, uh, 0 0.1 points for the performance assessment. So that accounts to uh, your grade in the performance assessment. And for some students that can help to, to go from uh, failing to passing. For other students that go to, uh, that reach a nine, for instance, in the performance assessment, that those will typically get a, a 10 or actually a 10.2, uh, but we round that down to a 10. And if you are already for in for a 10, then don't bother about uh, the, the, the deadlines, but that is not, not, never a good advice. Um, why do we want these deadlines? First of all, the motivation is by given by yourselves. You, we see that you work better when you have a proper 
set a deadline. The second thing is when you work against the deadline, then you will have questions which you will ask in the lessons and that will make it uh, more interactive and also help, help us to see what the difficult points are for the students. Because what we typically do, we introduce uh, not all new things, at, not, at least not for us, but new things for you. And we want to make sure that we prepare our lessons properly and also uh, give enough information for your um, uh, assignments without giving you the solution, of course. And that is, uh, that is the idea. So we want more interactivity and we think that is stimulated by using this, uh, these deadlines. Now, let's, now that's uh, what I wanted to say about uh, the rules and regulations. You'll see a reminder. Oh, um, I don't hear you, Richard. Yeah, maybe a word on the mini assessment. Oh yes, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, very, very, very correct. <clears throat> it's not only deadlines. We will also uh, do uh, um, take a sample of the students each week, and we call that a mini assessment. So we select a few students randomly, and we'll ask those students in an online session, typically as is now in in uh, team in teams. So we'll simply ask you to uh, attend a meeting or come into a meeting. And we'll make that a private meeting so that we can talk uh, about you on your uh, solutions. And we'll do that after the deadline of, the, of uh, an assignment. Not before, but after the deadline. So say that we want to see what you did on the assignments for week, um, for week uh, one. Then in three weeks, in two weeks, working week's time, we'll uh, select a few students, typically between 10 and 20 students, to, uh, to shortly talk about the exercise. And what we want to verify is that you understand that uh, what the uh, exercise is all about, that we get, get an idea that you were able to do it yourselves and actually did it yourself. That is what we mean with authenticity of your work. And uh, it also helps you to, uh, to, to, stimulate, to, to stimulate our students to do their work in, and, and in time. So that is uh, the general idea. So uh, the important thing is here is uh, don't miss the deadline because that is very important uh, for us, for the quality of the lessons, but also for you because it, uh, it is rewarded with uh, extra points that we, what, well, that, what uh, our colleagues advised. Mini assessment is one thing to, to give you feedback. Actually, that's the most important reason about this mini assessment. Giving an, 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 an additional uh, 0.1 point to stimulate, to make it rewarding to be in time is the other thing. And we will monitor your work, um, and you can see that over here, this page it, it contains all the work that you that you'll have to do. And if I simply look at one, uh, uh, sir, we can see the page. Yes. Sorry, you can't. You're you're right. I should switch uh, my screen. Thank you for the for the remark. Uh, here you see uh, the homework in homework index for PSC two. And if I switch to a student, for instance, uh, well, let's take this one. <laughs> Uh, he must start his exercise. That's fine because officially the exercises have not been published yet. You will publish the, uh, the exercises at the day of the lesson, typically something before. So I, we publish this them today at 11 o'clock. And there's also a, a blue beam below, below um, the exercise or in, in this, this icon that uh, stands for one exercise. And that shows how much time you have left. Uh, now it's of course, 100 percent and that is what you uh, will will see we of course have to test if this uh, envi environment works so we have an other student this one that did the exercises but the only reason that this student did the exercises to make sure that it works for all of you and what you will see in these exercises is that we run our te your tests on your own code we run our test on your code but only after you have shown us that you have tested enough of your stuff. That is what it's meant with coverage. We'll come back to in, uh, in detail into what coverage actually means in a further lesson, or maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll address that in a bit more detail, but that's what we'll, we'll see in, uh, but we'll, that's what we use. What we also may, it's not currently not implemented, that we not only test your code with our test, that is this AB, A stands for teacher and B is the student, but also that we uh, try your tests on our uh, code and that code is really broken. So your tests should then become red, not green. So that is, that is uh, in general the idea. This is uh, no longer 
of interest. This is also no longer of interest. This is uh, the remainder of the top. So let's have a look at, uh, at this, uh, these, these things again. Let's have a look if this refreshes a bit. Yes, you see there are bonus points. You'll be rewarded and it is uh, beneficial to you. And then um, let's go into uh, the details of how we think you should work. The typical way of working is actually uh, more or less modeled after the test-driven development and uh, idea. That trust de driven development means that you do your uh, development in tiny steps. And the tiny steps are always you write a test, then see that the test fails because the code is not there, the code does it wrong, or your initial simple implementation, actually the thing that the IDE generates is broken. It doesn't do what the requirement says. Then you make that code pass the, uh, the test, and it is typically the, the cycle, but often enough, you have a need to change your code a bit, and that is what we call refactoring, in such a way that it becomes better in all kinds of uh, aspects. For instance, readability, or uh, the, the proper naming, or um, uh, the, a better structure. That is typically what, what happens. And once you've done your tiny step of refactoring, all these tiny steps, you test again, and typically uh, your test is either simply green, so you're here, back here, or you have to improve your uh, implementation because with this refactoring, you introduced actually a new, something like a new feature, so you should write a new test. Typically, do not modify the test because the original test should be okay, but add a test to make sure that you show what, uh, what, that, what that does. There's a bit more here on this page. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit, yes. Uh, of course, we have an MS Team channel. You already know that, so that is nothing new. Um, and what we do, and uh, you already have seen that on the on the website, we do automatic correction of your exercises. That is, we don't do that. We taught the computer how to do that. And what the computer does, it actually is cooking with water, in this case, Maven. So it runs Maven scripts to check your work and check your work against our test and so on. Um, the remainder of classes is, uh, are these. We have 12, we envision 12 weeks of teaching. There are 14 teaching weeks, so we have, at the end, you have two weeks to fulfill the requirement of your last deadline. That is uh, one idea. And the other idea, that's enough. 12 weeks of this uh, rather uh, advanced Java is, uh, is simply enough. What you should start with is not uh, immediately reading uh, lesson uh, one, but also uh, look into setup. Setup is about what you should do. Let's simply have a look at it. Uh, uh, set up uh, your stuff, you're installing uh, a proper Java version. You need to have at least Java version 11, otherwise your, your programs will not work, or um, our scripts will not work, the, the Maven, Maven will not work because we require some Java 11 features, which is good because the books that we advise, uh, Horstmann, Volume 1 and 2, are about Java 11. You also, uh, we also advise you to install Apache Maven, uh, in particular when you're not using uh, uh, NetBeans IDE, because uh, other IDEs may not use Maven in the way that it is intended, because uh, on our build server, that is the server that does the testing, we don't have... Um, we, um, we, we don't uh, have a, an IDE that does the clicking. It is simply executing the Maven scripts in your program. So that is, that is what we do. Um, so that is about the setup part. I'll, we'll show a short, some parts of this uh, in, in this lesson, but for the remainder, you have to look into the details for yourselves. So now let's simply start at the lesson proper. And for that, um, I have a lesson script, of course. That is, those are the things that I want to talk about you, to, uh, to you about. That is, uh, start with the top menu. This is uh, what our stuff is. And uh, talk about the deadline and bonus. I already did, did that to show the TDD cycle. Um, and then it's, uh, ob obviously, it's a slide show time. So let's go to week one again. There's at the bottom, you see over here, uh, you see um, the slide set. And let's simply visit, visit that slide set and again do a full screen um, of this, uh, this simple set of slides. 
So what do we want to do is work test driven. And test driven means actually what it what the word says, write your tests before you write any uh, business code, any code, I should say code. It's not all always about business, but it's, it's the code that you want to write. Now you might ask yourself, where do I start? Well, what you will do in project two is write down a lot of requirements and from those requirements you can derive your tests. And when you do that, you uh, will quickly see, uh, will quickly be able to find a simple test. Start with a simple test. And that simple test should also test a simple feature. Uh, the example later on in this lesson is we'll, we'll, we'll develop a, a stack, a, a simple data structure in a test driven way. And we start with this tiniest possible stack. The, the, sorry, test. The first thing we do is, uh, can we make a stack? So we invoke a constructor. And after that, uh, uh, we have such a stack instance, we test if it's empty. So there's a constructor to be made and a first test uh, to see if there's an is empty method that returns the proper value. And the initial value is very simple. Actually, it is almost the default value that, uh, that the IDE, IDE will generate for you. Not quite, but uh, it's, it's, it's near enough. Um, and once you have written your test, then you run the test and the first version of, or the first run of that test should actually be read. Why? You're not only improving the code, but you want to make sure that your test indeed says something about the quality of your code. And a test can only show it's working if it's read. So for a test, a good color is always red. For your code, on the other hand, the good color is green, meaning that the test tests if your code is properly working and green shows that the code that is being tested works as the test wants it to work. Um, that is typically on this, uh, in this page. So write a tiny test. Um, programming, you are, well, maybe I shouldn't use the word, but I'll do it anyway. You are newbies at, uh, as far as programming is concerned. The same as babies, babies learn to walk in tiny steps, not in big strides and running uh, at a, uh, from the start. They do it in tiny steps, a tiny step to test, and then a tiny step to implement. And then you are almost certain that everything, every line of code that you work has a test that proves that that line of code is uh, indeed meaningful and correct. And also, when you do it in this way, you also will always have a test that tests a specific piece of code. That is um, often expressed as some kind of coverage. And coverage says that um, the tests test the code. So a coverage of 100% means that all the tests that you have um, execute all the code that you have written. You'll see that uh, also in, in the demonstration. So what you should not do is write, start uh, writing tests. First of all, it's really boring to write tests because that uh, you, see, you write a lot of tests, you have no clue if it's correct, you do not have a clue if it's uh, um, meaningful, and you will also know, not know if these tests can easily be met. So always write one test, one implementation, next test, next implementation, and so on. Um, what is even worse, don't write the implementation first. You may think about a design, as in the classes that you want to have and the names of the method, that's all fine. But don't write the implementation first because typically you will have a lot of trouble uh, covering all the code that you have. We see a lot of students that, still a lot of students that uh, write implementation first and then have a hard time to get the coverage right. So if you work test driven, test first, and then the implementation, then always the test will show that the code works correct. And it will also, also execute all of the code that you have. Um, and also tests that never fail are useless. A test must have been read before it may do its work on the actual code. So a uh, test that can't be read ever because of, well, it doesn't really test anything or your business code always uh, says the, has the same reply, so never a faulty reply, then uh, the best advice we can give you is throw the test out because a test that is never green is not meaningful in your application. 
Okay, the next thing is, now we know what the idea of testing is, how do you test the code? For that we use assertions. Assertion is the word, and actually it's a keyword in Java by the way, that you can use to assert that something is true. So an assertion is something about a Boolean expression. If you write in a Java program assert and then some uh, expression that produces a Boolean result, then you get, a, uh, you get a true or false. And if the assertion says that the expression returns false, then the remainder of the code is no longer uh, executed. Based on that idea, unit testing has been developed. And you have seen that already if you did the exercises in the MOOC. There was a short, short introduction on, um, on assertions that, um, that showed you what you, what you can do. So, um, what do we, uh, well, this is the explanation of assert, to assert. It's a transitive verb. And what we, be, what we will be doing is we'll, uh, we chose to use two modern frameworks. Why modern? Because it makes your work easier. It works, and <laughs> the, the fun thing here again is we learned new things. And that is, uh, as we said, valuable. We, we like that. We like to learn new things because we think they are interesting, but also these things uh, are useful for students. And we think that uh, in the, co the combination of uh, using JUnit 5, the framework, but also assert J to do the assertions, we can get a nicer set of uh, testing frameworks and uh, that will be helpful for you to, to write your tests in an easier way. Okay, um, now let's have a class. No, th sorry, this is a test class. Um, and this, you, although you can't see it from the, the name of the class, but you see inside in the test class that you have a method, which is called a test method. The name, the meaning of uh, that name uh, should be obvious. Indentation is off, but uh, that's, that's okay. And what you see here is yet that uh, inside the test method, you do an assertion. And assert that, that is part of the assert j library. The assert j, uh, the, sorry, the assert that method requires a parameter and through the smartness of Java and strongly typed languages, it knows what kind of object it is, type-wise. So if you put in a string, it can do useful things, useful operations on that string. If you put in a collection, then it can do useful operations on the collection. And even if you make your own class or your own uh, implementation of something, if you give it enough hints, then it can do things that are meaningful. For instance, if you uh, implement a queue, and that is one of the exercises in this week, and you make that queue iterable, then that queue can be used in a for each loop. Then you can look to all the elements of the queue without uh, modifying the queue. That is uh, the, the, the trick. And then with assertj, you can simply ask assertj um, whether or not it contains all the elements that you expected. So it will simply say, um, I expect all these elements to be in this, uh, in this queue. And that is uh, uh, very easy. You can simply write that as just one uh, statement. You can see that uh, something like here. So assume that this object of interest is a list. Then uh, this uh, you can s write some assertion. The name is different. But for instance, it, you can specify that uh, that list should contain certain elements or contain exactly certain elements or uh, contain exactly uh, certain elements but in any order. All these tests are uh, easy enough. Um, well, that's a zoo of, um, of tests. So after the, um, after the assert uh, that expression with your object of interest, you write some assertion. And the assertions are these. So you have a test, uh, test true, you have a test false, you have an is null, you have a is not null, you have an is equal to, and then you have, must specify what the expected value is. And you can also specify uh, is same as. Has anyone any idea what the difference between equal to and same as is? Hands, please. Ah, good. Glenn, go ahead. Um, 
maybe I think the is equal to kind of expects the same result and is same as is literally just as the same what they expect. Yes, kind of? that, that that is uh, about right. Um, that is the same specifies that you really want to look at the same object, meaning that the reference to object A and the reference uh, to object B are pointing to the same. In this case, let's let's say take this gorilla. That that the object that is the object of interest. So you have two point two references. Let's do it. Oh, let's do it like this. They both point to the same object. You can of course have two strings. Uh, the example is better in strings uh, that have the same content, uh, or two student objects that have the same values for all the fields. Then those two students would compare equal, but they are not necessarily the same object. So there's a Sometimes you want to have, for instance, um, the example is for uh, the, the uh, same test is say you put something in a collection and later on you want to uh, uh, get it back. You want to make sure that nobody copied it and gave you a copy and uh, now you want the original back. And so if you want to assert that you get the original back, then use the uh, same, uh, uh, is, uh, same as test. And otherwise the as is equal to test is the most used uh, version of assertions. This is actually used for if you do a co computation or a calculation or, if you, or you produce some object, the assert equal to is typically uh, the thing that you want to use in your test. That's the, the most, I think the most used uh, assertion. Um, the other ones, and those are the luxury ones in assertJ, and that's why we chose assertJ, because not only just for simple tests and equals and null and not null and same, you can also verify things uh, on collections, on iterables, and all other kinds of interesting things. For instance, uh, if you write a, a string, then you do not necessarily want the exact formatting right, because that makes your, makes your tests uh, break very easily when someone ch changes the formatting, but you want uh, special or important information. For instance, if you want to uh, have to have information on the student, for instance, if you want to make a grade list of student, what you want to have is the student number, that is one requirement, and the name of the student, that is uh, the, the sufficient in information. And in that case, you can simply ask uh, if uh, the, the string that in, in this case contains uh, the student number and contains the name of the student so that is a very easy test. Um, there is a variant, an iterable. Yeah, that is uh, a bit of detail I do not want to talk about now. You can read that in the SOJ documentation, which is a very good read, by the way. That is another, another reason why we chose SOJ. It is actually fun to read it. Well, well, as far as I'm concerned, at least. I don't know if you agree, but uh, I think it's, it's fun to read. So something. What you also can do in a SOJ, and that is also very powerful, you can specify your object of interest. For instance, you have an object which has a, which has a spelling error, um, but otherwise it be a method returning a string. That is the idea. You specify uh, the, a message when the test fails, but you can, for instance, then verify that that element is not nil. And if it's nil, then the test will stop and say, this is nil, I can't do it. And continue any further but if it's not nil the next method will be invoked and that is the is not empty test because let's assume that this uh, method returning string I I returns uh, a non-empty uh, string or a non-blank string then you can test it in this way adding this is not null test uh, before you do the rest of the assertion is often quite smart Otherwise, you get null pointers all, uh, all over the place, in, the, in, uh, in particular in the tests, and it is uh, typically not uh, something that you want to do. Yeah, um, here are some examples about uh, about uh, collections, and uh, also that the size and the order of the elements may matter. And these um, examples are taken from the documentation of SRJ, and I'm quite not quite sure if you know. Um, uh, your books like uh, Lord of the Rings or maybe your films. Most people have seen the film and never read the book. I'm one of them. Um, and here, for instance, you see a test that says, uh, assert that the Fellowship of a Ring contains uh, nine heroes and uh, it, sh it should contain uh, Boromir and, and Gandalf, that's a wizard, and Frodo, uh, that is um, a hobbit, of course, and Leolas, that's an elf. 
but should not contain Saruman and uh, Elrond because they are both not element of uh, the, uh, the, um, the fellowship. You can see that you can have all kind of nice tests. Here you see that uh, from the fellowship of the, uh, of the ring, the collection, we uh, extract from each of the elements the name field uh, of type string and then simply see if that name field produces Boromir, Gandalf, Frodo and Legolas. That's a bit of a mouthful. If you had to write that yourself, you had a, would have a hard time, but you don't have to. You only have to need uh, to use these, uh, these uh, asserts in your tests. And because they are so powerful, they make writing your test easier. Same here. You want to extract the race of, a, of a, one of these uh, heroes, extracting the race, and that is an enum, I think. I'm not quite sure, but uh, anyway, that uh, that race in the following in the fellowship should be uh, two, uh, no, four hobbits, one Maya, that is the uh, wizard, uh, one elf, one dwarf, and two men, two men, uh, Legolas and uh, oh, that is that is bad. What is the, the the last character? The king, the later king. Uh, Strider is one of these his his, his uh, names, and uh, Aragon is the is the proper name. That's the one. And that is also the, la the last slide that I wanted to show you. So that is uh, also good. So that is um, that is the slides. There are also a few videos uh, if you have uh, if you have time left left over then you could at, uh, look at these uh, videos this is a stack and we'll uh, develop a stack too and these are two other videos that uh, show you a bit about how I'm developing uh, stuff using a test driven way uh, on a few parts it's a bit different as the, the way that we want to teach you stuff in this uh, uh, this year uh, in particular, it doesn't use SRJ and doesn't use JUnit 5, but otherwise, concept conceptually, it's uh, the same idea. Um, now, the next thing should be that you need to set up your environment. And I'll try to simulate that as best as possible. Um, that is, um, show you what you could have done, done or should have done. And uh, looking at the, uh, let's think, no, not not really. What you what you will do, because you have to meet a deadline, is prepare your IDE and Maven. That is the first exercise. And once you've done that, you should be able to run this uh, first exercise. And then uh, let's have a look and then uh, write a test and then make sure that your application uh, complies with this test. It's a very simple application. It is more or less a hello world, but it ensures that your machine is, is working. Let me uh, show you how that works using uh, NetBeans. Um, the, one of the difficulties that we will certainly have this year is that the students in semester one learned to work with, uh, sorry, with GitHub. Um, GitHub and Git is a very powerful tool, um, but it misses a few features that we uh, dearly uh, need in our uh, way of teaching. For instance, version number in uh, subversion is very simple. They start with one and simply increment. The next thing, it is very easy to ask subversion, when was this committed? And that is a bit hard in Git because it hasn't been designed by that. And the other thing, and maybe the most important thing is our build server knows what to do with uh, subversion and how to obtain stuff and also how to report the information that it finds in your uh, GitHub repositories. So what you will do is you will uh, use uh, NetBeans to get your work and it is akin a bit like the way of working in um, the MOOC. You have a plugin which is comes out of the box with uh, subver uh, sorry with NetBeans, and that is called uh, it's under Team. And under Team you find uh, multiple um, versioning systems. Git is on top, so you will like that for your project. But uh, and uh, Subversion is third. And what we can use that for is simply check out our stuff. You start like this because what you saw just now is what I already did in a, an experiment to make sure that uh, it works as intended. And let's have a look. It works as in intended. 
but you need to um, insert your proper URL. In, uh, in, on top of every page, you find two links. The top link is your homework link, and the bottom one is the link to your repositories using PeerWeb. So you must uh, make sure that you have a password in PeerWeb. You can uh, obtain one at the bottom, and also uh, that you log in. And then you find all the repositories that you have. You can imagine that I, as a teacher, have more repositories than you as a newbie student. But uh, and you will be able to recognize the, um, the, the 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 repository by the name of the module. For instance, here you have PLC2, which is uh, the module. SVN root is not of relevant, but, but I know that I have group number one uh, one six nine. <coughs> if you go to your own page. Uh, then, then you'll see simply simply see all the repository all the subversions repositories that you have. I can show that for you. Uh, then, if I select students by class, for instance, the Dutch students, and then I could go to Sjoerd Sjoerd Bruinen. That's the first one. He also has a repository, uh, PRC2 uh, group uh, 107, and you have to enter your uh, peer web. One. I always have a hard time typing passwords when someone is looking, and I have the idea that you are looking, all uh, 78, 78 of you. And here you see the uh, exercises that, uh, in this case, that uh, Short has in his repository, and only the exercises for four, for week one in are in there. Of course, I don't want to look at uh, Short's exercises. I instead want to look at my own exercises. So my own sandbox, the one that you show, uh, I've seen in the, in the dashboard. So what I'll do is I copy the link. You can do it two ways. Personally, I find this one a bit awkward because, as you see, I missed the letter. Simply do a right click and then copy link address and then paste it into this um, into to this uh, box. You can uh, you can uh, remember multiple URLs, so whatever. Again, specify your username and your password. And if you check this box, then um, a password manager will pop up and you have to give that a password too, a private password. But this is your um, Fontes Fenlu, your peer web password. And then the next uh, step would be uh, uh, click on ne next and then browse into re repository. You can use a browser button. And then you see the same structure information or information that you had before. Uh, branches, tags, and uh, trunk. Um, uh, of those, only trunk is relevant. The other two are traditional uh, in subversion. And what you should do uh, typically is simply check out trunk, because trunk will contain subdirectories weeks, and inside those weeks you will have your projects. So I'll check out trunk, and I'll give it a place on my desktop. Uh, sorry, in my machine. So what I did, I created um, a, a subdirectory. Uh, let's have a look. Something like this. Um, now I went down too far. That's no big deal. This is my home directory. Inside my home directory, I have a directory called Fontis, for obvious reason. Then semester two, then PLC2, and that is the directory I want to use. And then I could choose to copy. Um, uh, I can use this simply to check out my stuff. Your uh, choosing of names and, and semesters and whatnot is might be different, but be warned, please try to avoid spaces in these names. Yes, that is a, that is a very common issue that we, we have uh, questions of students that uh, made a directory and that directory happens to contain a, uh, a space. And then Maven will have a hard time to run your, uh, the programs in there because it needs, for some reason, it needs the, the path, so the full directory name, uh, inside uh, inside that, uh, that stuff. So avoid spaces in these names. Now then do finish. And then we'll, what we'll have is an SVN checkout. And it take a bit of time. It's not that fast. That is uh, maybe one of the disadvantages. And then after it's uh, checked out or 
updated uh, its stuff, you can open uh, the projects that are contained. And you see over here that there uh, are in total four projects contained. And if I click on one, then you re recognize them as uh, NetBeans projects, the same or a similar structure as you are used to in the MOOC. So let's simply uh, open these exercises. And now you see that I have my personalized, the group 169 version of all the exercises. And inside the exercises, there is the, the task of the first week. And here you see, well, this, this is the solution. I shouldn't show you that, but that's, that's not a big deal in this exercise. Um, let's have a look, close order. That is not, not that big of a deal, but uh, uh, that is uh, what your uh, exercises will contain. So this is, uh, these are then the projects for this week. Next week, or actually next next week, uh, calendar, calendar wise, we'll uh, insert four more, th two or three or four more exercises for the next week in your repository. What you need to do is simply update your repository using NetBeans as well. You can just easily find that because team, once you have team, let's have a look, subversion, uh, check out, and then uh, next. And then uh, next finish. It, what it will do is will simply check out the additional stuff that you have. So you can simply fetch, also fetch the, the new exercises if they might be there. Yeah. Okay. I don't uh, really need these exercises um, at the moment because what I want to show you is your, how do you develop stack test driven. But Peter, yeah. maybe uh, that's yes. because you, you know explain the checkout, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe you can and, and you use the word sandbox. Mm -hmm. Can you in one sentence uh, uh, explain again what that what that means? Oh yes, I can, of course. Um, well, you are already acquainted a bit with the idea that you have a repository and a way the, on which you can work with your code. Um, the name that uh, stuck for that concept is the sandbox. Think of yourself as a little child playing in a sandbox and you can do all kinds of things. And only when you are satisfied with the work, then you want to send it back to the repository. So you have a local copy, a local copy of what is in the repository. And only when you commit the stuff, I'll show you that in a, in a second too. If, if you commit the stuff, uh, then uh, that version is visible to both the, the repository, but also uh, uh, to our build server. So the sandbox is your local copy of the stuff. And what you need to do is to commit the stuff that is send it to the uh, repository. That is almost the same as uh, we, we you did in, um, in, in the MOOC. I'll, I'll can, uh, demo, well, let's, let's simply demonstrate that. That's nice enough because that is, that is a useful remark. Uh, let's have a look. I should um, reopen the recent projects. Simply go back to the first contact. Uh, you've already seen a bit of that. Uh, that's that's fine. That's no no big deal. And uh, what I do here is uh, I simply make one small modification. Yeah. As far as uh, uh, NetBeans is concerned and Subversion is concerned, this file has now the modification. What I, you typically will do is commit the whole project. And for that, you right click on the project and then select Subversion and do a commit and then uh, demo. Um, you will see that uh, NetBeans shows you what files have been modified in this set and it will only send that file uh, across. But the effect will be that the repository then contains all new versions and including the uh, new version of greeting.java and it will send a message to the build server and the build server will then build that stuff. So let's simply commit this uh, change. It takes a bit of time. That's not already done. Now I'm at version number 21. So I was thrifty uh, in preparing this stuff, actually testing a lot. And uh, that would then be the version that, uh, that we have. And uh, after some time, I'm not quite sure if you can see that now, but after some time, you'll see that this uh, file has been modified. Let's have a look. If I point at it, you see that it has been modified just now. So 1144, and it may take, take some time before it has been built again. So uh, the, the compiler has had done its work. Uh, the testing have been executed all by means of a, a, a Maven script. Um, yeah, 
what I should do, and otherwise I forget to do that, is also show um, um, show the students that you need a settings file. And uh, that settings file is the settings not for NetBeans, but is the settings file for Maven. That also means that that settings file lives in the Maven directory. And to show you that, uh, yes, I go to my home directory. The Maven directory is traditionally, uh, traditionally named .m2. So you see in here a .m2 directory. If I go into that directory, just for purpose of demonstration, and then move the settings file out of the way, for instance, by giving it a different name, then you'll see that, Maven, that NetBeans no longer recognizes this, um, this settings file. If I now try to build my project, it still works, which, <laughs> which actually it shouldn't, but uh, that is because I ran it before. But uh, now I don't have a settings file and to make a settings file is relatively easy. Um, you simply click on project files, or so not on the POM, but on project files, do a right click and then uh, type create settings file. The settings file itself um, needs a specific content and that specific content is shown in the setup pages on PLC2. Uh, let's have a look of, at that. Yes, that's this one. So I should move over a bit. Why is this folded like this? So ugly. That's not nice. Uh, up. Yeah, there you go. And uh, now I can find all of these. I can find setup. And in here you can find what this setting file should actually contain. This is the, the actual content that you need in your settings file. This is a lot of text. Well, a lot of comment, but you don't need that. But what you need is this settings file. What it does, it gives you access to a repository that we maintain. And in that repository, we have a so-called SEBI POM or parent POM for all our projects in which we stick all the goodies that you need for testing. Only the testing dependencies are in there. And once you do that, you get a lot of nice features to create all kind of uh, nice reports about your code, in particular, the test uh, reports, but also the, the reports that are produced when you're running it, a coverage too. We'll see that in a second. So to, what I will do is well, we'll undo my change. And now we have it back again. See, now I, I have my original, so that's the same as what you saw on the website, the same content. And if I then run my uh, uh, test, then you can see that the test is still working as it should. This is uh, an exercise that I al already completed, but this is not the exercise I want to demonstrate in this class. What I want to do is um, I want to test-driven develop uh, a stack. Um, to make, um, and to start with that, I already prepared a small project. Uh, I have a script for that, but that doesn't run on all machines, so don't bother. I have a script for that, and that script is somewhere in uh, in here, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, project that I've created is somewhere in here. I called it Simple Stack. If you see something that is called simple, then you can think that is probably Homberg. Uh, it's, it sounds simple, but it might not always be the case. Anyway, what we will do, um, what we will do in this case, we will start uh, developing a stack in a test-driven driven fashion. So what is the first thing that you do? test driven, you write a test. Where do you write a test? In a test class. How do you name your test class? Well, typically after the thing that you want to uh, test, but append test or test at the end. So let's let's simply do that. Create a new unit test. You see, you see that I've done that before. And then call that unit test with a capital S tag because it's a type. Java classes always start with a capital. Put it in the test packages, which is the default. And I personally turn off all these boxes because otherwise you get uh, code generated, which is uh, really junk as far as I'm concerned, but that's how NetBeans works in this instance. Now I click finish and I, ha I have my um, test set up. 
Notice that you, if you choose your, uh, your standard uh, JUnit test, I modified it a little bit, then you will have a different library over there, but this one is okay. And this is something I typically do not need. But you also notice that when I uh, create a new class that it uh, puts my name as an author in there. Um, <coughs> that is not so, so uh, important. The other thing is that uh, we, uh, we do not really need a constructor. Sometimes you, you need it, but uh, typically you don't. And uh, well, now we have the spot or the place where we can put our tests in. And now we should start writing our first test. Because I'm uh, known as a teacher at Fontis who can't type, uh, I made myself uh, my work a bit easier by introducing a short uh, helper functions. And you and I'll already start, and I use that by simply calling macro, call them macros or keyboard uh, shortcuts or completions. It's keyboard shortcuts, I think. Uh, then uh, what you, when you type that, uh, it's actually the same as you already know, PSVM, you have seen that in the MOOC, or uh, PU, public, all these things uh, work in a, in a similar way. So they are keyboard shortcuts. What you should do is whenever you uh, use this, Jutum, uh, give that method a proper name. Um, let's see, stack is empty. Let's simply call it like that. That is a useful, uh, might be a useful name, but actually I wanted to test that the stack is, a new stack is empty. So I already have an idea in my head because I know what a stack is. And you also know what a stack is. I can show you a stack. Here you have a stack with a book. Oh, sorry, with a book and, and a box of, uh, what is it? Is it uh, Kleenex on top and uh, something else? This is a stack. Your things that you put on top of each other. And typically, if you want to get the middle, you mess things up. So you, what you only do is take elements from the top or put them back on the top. Um, if I would turn my camera, you could look uh, into my room and you'll see that I have a stack on, of books at the left hand side. And you also know that what is on top of the stack is the thing that you're currently working with or the book that you read latest. That is typically how a stack works. It's a very simple data structure, but also a very powerful data structure because a lot of programming languages and the way that computers work depend on a stack. Those details will be explained later on in other courses, but uh, think of it as the way that um, a program passes uh, parameters to a method that it wants to call, and then coming back from that method. That also uses a stack. Anyway, long, uh, long, um, long talk, a lot of words about a very simple concept. What I also want is that this stack is uh, generic. In PRC1, you learned what generics is. You can have a generic box or generic list. And what uh, Java allows you to do is insert a type token. And once uh, that allows you to specify what kind of elements that you want to have in your uh, list or box, or in this case, a stack, so that you can make a stack of strings and a stack of integers and a stack of students and a stack of cars and a stack of books, why not? Um, and, and that is what generics uh, makes possible. You have seen that in, in the MOOC already, in PLC1 already, so we'll also do that. To, uh, to convince the IDE that we want a generic stack, we must first write two lines that create a stack and do not bother too much that the compiler, or the, actually the IDE, no, the, I, the compiler complains and the IDE uh, uh, thinks it has help resist the urge to immediately let it uh, complete the work. What I do is I write a string, uh, sorry, a stack of uh, a K, of course, of a stack, a string, and I call it string stack, string, string, stack, stack, is new uh, stack. And you see that you can't use completion because what I'm creating is not available yet. Uh, there is a stack in the standard Java, so uh, resist the urge to use this one because otherwise your <laughs> exercise is, uh, well, s solved, but you do not learn anything. So don't do that. Instead, uh, let it 
uh, make it let it uh, create a stack in the source packages because that is how we develop stuff inside the source package but i won't do that yet i first make a copy of this line and make a different stack and put something else in there and the, is the easiest thing is is integer and now i have two of these beasts and now let's see what the ide does yeah because the, uh, the compiler will say like, this doesn't exist um i can't compile this so uh, if i try to compile it it will not work you can also see that on the file because it gives you a red bulb over there so let's see what happens if i click one of these yellow bulbs here it says create a stack in the packages uh, simple stack inside the test packages that is not very useful uh, but creating in the source package is useful uh, create a stack class inside this test class that is not useful search the dependencies that is what you could do split into declaration and assignment that is not relevant and configure unused elements hint that is another thing the so solution to the problem is actually choosing the third option in this case let's ha do that and you see that by choosing by first of all creating inside the test method two two um, instances of a stack with a different type token with a different t for the generic t you get a stack the kind of stack that you want so you saw that i typed a little and the ide generated a lot well a lot more or less yeah this is what uh, what happens so i didn't write any line inside i only even only removed stuff from here now you still will see, uh, no, now the, the, the IDE is uh, satisfied. Now, the test is called, is empty. And I, what I want, I want to develop a Boolean method. So a method that returns a Boolean value that tells me true if the stack is empty and false otherwise. So if the stack contains elements. What I need to do is completely specify that method. So type return value uh, and then call that uh, call that uh, variable give that variable a name i call it empty and then i do uh, a string stack stack dot is and now you can't do completion because the method doesn't exist so you can't do anything here no suggestions which is actually obvious because the method that you want to make does not uh, exist yet so by typing this, yes, by typing this, you get again uh, a bulb of the IDE and it says create empty stack in simple stack. If I click on that and look inside my stack, I see that this method has been created. Yeah, simply added the method. What I now can do is um, making sure you already see that uh, the IDE says, oh, I, 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 I recognize that this stack already contains this is empty method. What I now can do is simply invoke this method. Uh, invoke the method, run the tests. So what I can do is simply run the tests like this, select test over there, or select the project and select this one over here. That is a configuration that you can also apply, but it is similar to what you uh, have seen in the MOOC. So let's see what happens. And you now see that the test uh, is failing and it fails and let's run it again uh, so by selecting this test result let's run it again and now you see over here it is failing and it is very failing seriously that is with a red not with a yellow which is normal or which is the better color actually in this case but it simply says not supported yet it says when you invoke the method uh, is empty it says not supported yet where does that come from well from the implementation because NetBeans might look smart but it's a computer programs program and it doesn't have any imagination so in this case it will produce an exception it says well i don't know how to do this so let's throw an exception because um, uh, i have no clue how to implement this thing and i always can throw an exception and then the programmer will notice Certainly a programmer that is uh, working test driven will notice that he gets an error, not a failing test, but an error because this method uh, is simply through an exception. Now, what, uh, what can I do? What is the simplest possible solution, um, 
uh, implementation for this uh, for this method to make it fail would be return false let's uh, rerun the test so that is an implementation that i can have and now you see that i have not uh, no longer a red a fail but a yellow fail that is an actual failing test it says failed new text completed successfully you know what to do hey that is a bit strange i didn't actually write proper testing because what i should do is that the variable that i declared over here empty has the proper uh, properties is false in this case so what i must do instead and, and oh, oh yes, uh, and what the, the, the test failing does is this last line. What my macro, you've seen that, PM, what my macro always does is insert this failing line. So if you forget to write a test, then you get an error or a failing test, and which is a good thing because the test says, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready for work yet. So back to uh, the, the assertions. What we need to do is assert that. And then inside the assert that, put the variable that we declared, the more empty variable, and then uh, press a dot and see what assert j offers as possibilities. It uh, offers you all kinds of things like the information, um, but also two, uh, um, two bold ones, is equals and is false. And uh, is equals is false and probably a bit lower. Is, there's also an is true. Yeah, there you go. There's also an is true. So what I can do is st start typing is. And in this case, I want that my stack is empty, meaning that the condition should be true. In this case, I can simply complete with, um, with is true. Sometimes, actually quite often, it is useful to write a description. Uh, in this case, I have no mu mu not much um, imagination, but this is a kind of ex uh, description that you want to give when your uh, test is failing. Uh, new is not empty, something like this. This, and now you reformat your code, and that is what you can do. Let's see if this uh, what the test now does. So simply rerun the test by pressing the rerun button. And it reruns the tests, and you see now uh, that it says a bit, little bit different uh, um, information. It says failed with the, uh, the text that I specified over there, expecting value to be true but was false. That is because the assert with the combination of the is true completion uh, verifies that the value of MT is uh, should be true, but it isn't. Yeah, the reason for that is I introduced an error. I did that on purpose to make sure that I have a red test. Now let's make an implementation that will make our test pass true. So that is the next step. And rerun the test. I made a modification in my business code. Uh, the compiler is satisfied. Rerun your tests. Now this looks good, actually, because now it says, if you can, yeah, I don't know if you can read that. Can I zoom it in? Yes, I can. We can zoom in a bit. No, no, that's not a feast, but... Uh, readable. Sorry? It's re readable. It, it is readable. It says, TNU stack is empty, completed successfully, you know what to do. And that what you know what to do is, what I always do is comment that line. Not remove it, comment it out. Because sometimes you want to put it back if your test, uh, if, if you want to improve your test, for instance. Then you want to simply turn that test on so that you are, will always know wh where you're working. Now, if I rerun the test now, this fail method will no longer be in effect and you will have a green test. That is at least what I hope. So I have my first green. Bravo! What I would do now in this case, I would commit the stuff. I would go to sub, uh, subversion and do a commit. I won't do that yet because it's not very useful in this case, but that is a typical good approach because whenever you have something that works, you want to save it. If you use a versioning system like Git or, uh, or subversion, uh, you can always go back to the history. Uh, and that is important because um, if you had a work in version in some history, so say four or five versions back, you can get, uh, get that information back. You can also 
compare this information with the, with the current version and that is all very helpful so if you have something working correctly commit it immediately because well you will be uh, uh, grateful for that and you will never have the problem i had it working but now it broke and i can't no longer continue this is a way to avoid that okay we have our four first test but not of course a complete stack the next test that we want to write um, is another test that is if we put something on the stack then the stack should not be empty anymore so once we put on the stack something then we do not uh, want it to be empty anymore so we call the method utm um, push makes not oh, not empty t yes push makes not empty is the name i gave the test i think it's meaningful but if it's not to other people you might more want to modify the name and what i again need to do is uh, in this case a bit of copy and pasting uh, that is um, no first a copy and then move it down and then we have uh, again two stacks and now I want to push a string onto the string stack and integer onto the integer stack. And again, make sure that you uh, um, that uh, you do uh, completion after you implemented both things. So string stack dot uh, push. Now I have to type that because it doesn't exist. This is a method that doesn't exist yet. And uh, well, traditionally, if you have no clue put in hello that is uh, friendly and why not copy that line and uh, make this into an integer stack integer integer oh jesus stack i told you i can't type and put in a number yes like 42 that is also a traditional number you want to put in after you have inserted both methods and both methods tape, take a different type. One is a string and when the other one takes an integer. You then can click on this light. So create uh, the methods inside the stack. And let's, ha let's have a look what we have now. We have now this, this method. So this doesn't really work as I want it to work. And uh, you will see that uh, maybe I can sh show that this a bit better. Yeah, like like this now i have the stack over here and the test over there so they are nicely in one window and you, s you will see that if i save this one this method this uh, sorry this stack class that one of these lines will be satisfied uh yeah let's, let's save them all one of these lines should be satisfied but the other one isn't mm. actually i must say that it confuses me a bit but what we actually want is that this push operation doesn't take ints, but instead takes t's, because it's a generic stack, and uh, it should take ints, integers, integer objects. So these integer thingies, not the int values, and also string objects. And if I now uh, save my stack stuff, um, it should it should yeah it takes a bit of time because what you see the netbeans asks the compiler please please could you inspect this code and if it produces no longer any errors uh it will say okay this is this is fine so this looks okay as far as the compiler is concerned and now we must make a test that uh, that in, uh, that asserts that the effect that we want namely that the push makes the stack no longer empty is indeed in effect so what we need to do is we need to write it uh, we uh, again need to copy this line that is easy enough and then we can copy also copy this line i you will see in lesson two that i do not li like copying too much but in this case i'll allow myself to do that first of all then you don't have to wait for my typing but um, but also because it's almost the same so what we did is we ask the string stack th uh, that it is empty and we also uh, no longer empty and um, let's call this uh, string empty and uh, integer empty push this one a bit down and of course put an s in front of that one and then have this copied too 
So a copy and put it after the variable name, and then I have this this test. Actually, this test contains two two asserts. We'll advise against that, but for the time being, I take it as is because I want to force this IDE to make me a generic stack, and that is uh, by uh, by providing enough information so that it can guess what I want. And all sometimes I simply have to help it. So now I can run this test again, and you'll probably notice that this again contains this throw unsupported exception, so it will fail with a beautiful red. But I actually want it to fail with a yellow a failing test, not a test that is in, uh, that is improperly set up. So this is what you what you get. This is this line. If I click on it, then uh, let's have a look. If I click on it, then you s you get come to the offending line that causes the uh, the push operation. That is this line that causes this problem, and that is because when you call the push method, you get an exception. So what we need to do is well simplest solution is of course I'll well, ignore the value that gets in and then continue running the test because it's a void method and the void method doesn't have to uh, re uh, return anything but now we see that our test fails and and now you see that this test fails with a nice uh, yellow a failing test and the test that is failing is line number 36 that is this one and that says well this stack that you are creating doesn't report empty at the moment and it should it doesn't, but it should. So we must repair that too. Now to solve that problem, we first have to do a little bit of design, a tiny bit of design. And the tiny bit of design is best done on a piece of paper. And that piece of paper uh, is here. And we need to uh, uh, implement a stack. Normal stack, as a stack of books, looks so something like this. You have books on top of each other. You can, yes, you can see that, although it's a bit gray, a stack of books. And that is the operation. So push will take elements uh, from the top, uh, push uh, elements on the top, pop takes them off. You can also look at uh, the element. That's a peak operation. That will come in a second. We have 15 minutes left, something like that. Anyway, this is what the two step tech lo looks like. We want to put elements on top. And we want to, to remove elements from the, uh, from the top as well. So only at the top you, we will access elements, read from it, or put on it. But to make that in a computer program, you do not really have to make a, a structure that looks like this kind of stack. You only have to support the uh, put in and get out method called push for put in and pop for get out by making sure that, uh, that uh, you can do that. And what we do in this case we do not put the stack on top of something like a top of a table. Instead, we hang our stack at a nail. We put it something like uh, a chain of elements that are putting uh, that are on it on a chain on, a, uh, on some kind of a chain. So the first element that goes on the, on the on the stack will be the first element, and that first element can also point to the next element. Uh, sorry, I was should write it like this that can also point to the next element. And that next element can also point to the next element. Uh, again, uh, oops, like this. And that next element, well, let's stop over here. That next element says, I have no longer anything below me. And when you add an element to the stack, you do that at the top. And this top is the nail where we hang things on. And if you want to add uh, another element, what you do, is you take this line, you, something like you pick it off, up, put a new element in between, and put that new element on top of the stack. So um, I don't have chains here. That would be nicest to show, but that is the idea. The uh, yes. So what you, what you would do is something like you have at the top you have a chain with this uh, uh, bandaid, and then. And the next element would hang on. The, uh, sorry, the next element would hang uh, hang on that, and the next below that, and so on. And if you want to insert a new element, what you do is you pick the current element from the top, from that nail, and then uh, use that as the next for the newly created node, and put it on top. Now, this is a bit a bit of a mouthful. Maybe the uh, the explanation is not 
quite complete. But what we need is change, uh, links of a chain. And traditionally, these things are called nodes. And what I will do, I will create that node as a separate class. And I put that separate class inside this uh, file for the simple uh, purpose of, um, of a demonstration. And the class is called node. And also this node is generic. So that node will also be uh, of kind T. Uh, we can't see the oh can't my see yeah the yeah thank you for your remark good that should now solve that problem so this is uh yeah no no uh this is um this is uh, our node class that uh, will contain our elements so that node class has two fields the first field is the thing that we want to put in Traditionally, you call that an item or element. Uh, I stick to item. And the other one is a node of T. And that is the next element. So that allows you to attach, uh, to have, to have uh, something that uh, has a link to the next one. Yes, so you can there, thereby make a node of, um, a, a, st a stack of nodes. Again, this, this, this thing. That would be the item. This would be the location for the item, and that would be the next, next, next. And the last place, this next is empty. Um, yes. So what we now want to do is use this, uh, this stack, uh, sorry, this node to implement our stack. So this stack, this node will be used inside our push method. Inside the stack, we define our uh, the position where we want to attach the top element. And what better name than the top element is the name for this uh, method. Uh, sorry, for this field, I should say field. So what the push, uh, push method can do, the push method can get the top element and what, take whatever it points to, it can be either nil or uh, some real element, and make a new node with that, and with that implement with, with that node, uh, attach it to the top. So what I want to do is I may yes, want. Uh, we, we see your people. Oh yes, <laughs> again same remark. Thank you. Very good. You're paying attention. That I like that. Um, so what you want to do is make a new node and call it maybe new top. Why not? And in this new node, I want uh, to attach the. The, the top, but also the new element. So what I specify is I create a new node, um, put these uh, diamond symbol in, in there, and give it the top and, um, and the item. So let's also call this thing item. That is nicer, that two item. And that is almost it. Um, implementation wise um, but of course this node uh, this node class does exist and let's have a look what does the uh, the bulb here say it says uh, configure you unused elements okay now mm, think 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 no now I should be able to, I hoped to be able to click on, on this element, but it doesn't do any uh, f uh, very much useful. But actually what he actually should do is making me a constructor. Um, it might have to do with the fact that I wrote this in the same Java file. Uh, now it uh, is even more confused and once I've saved it. So it might be, let's experiment a bit, that if I move it up, that it recognizes this a bit better. It doesn't. Then I must uh, do the, the hard label by myself. So what I need to do is create a constructor inside this um, inside this node. And inside this node, I want to have a constructor which takes two elements. Yeah, but let's turn them around. So like this. And top is known as this node. And now I want to have my constructor. 
this is the constructor that I need and select all the elements and then you see that the constructor is created but also that this last piece is now uh, satisfied and uh, actually the complete operation is done because what I can do is I can uh, do something like this top is new top that is uh, completely legal and that actually does the work because first I made a new node and that new node links to what was previously on the previously on the top and now I can use that new top instead of the old top so what I can do is make it even shorter I can even uh, write it like this and forget this line so the push operation is really simple with a little bit of help of this constructor and a, bit of, a little bit of typing now we were still testing against emptiness of our node and we want whenever uh, we pushed something onto the stack that is empty says false it's no longer empty and the first push modifies the top to something which is no longer nil so probably the test that we need is that the top is no longer uh, sorry the top equals nil is equivalent to the stack being empty so let's have a look if this uh, does the trick we modified a lot of code maybe the steps were a bit too big but anyway we have um, written our code after we had a test now you see that this test becomes green it accepts this assert for the string test it assert, uh, checks this uh, test for the um, uh, integer stack and now it yeah. yes the, the marvin made a uh, remark in the in the chat and yes that, uh, in like 38 um uh, integer that should be that should check for the integer stack and yeah the yeah, stack. yeah yeah correct thank you marvin uh, very good i'm cheating uh, I'm lucky this is not, a t uh, not an assessment, but uh, you're right. Let's uh, assert that again. Run the test again. I modified something, so I must make sure that this uh, runs again. The typo is correct, and that is, uh, that is also very good that you mentioned that, Marvin, because what I'm showing you a little bit is flaky programming style. That is copy and wasting stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that at home. But I, do, uh, I allow myself to do that a little bit in, in, the, in this case. Anyway, you see that both the strict stack and the integer stack behave as expected and that we bump into the fail on line 43. If I com comment that line and run my test again, you see that my stack can push. Yes. Now, next thing we need to do. Uh, we want to take elements from the stack. The first thing that you want to see what is on top and what is on top is typically done with a method that is called peak that is at least uh, the method i choose in this case and oops uh, peak first i have, don't have a proper name and i'm a bit pressed for time so the me method name the test method name is called uh, peak first and what i need to do is again make a stack actually it's sufficient to make just a string stack because uh, i've convinced the uh, uh, compiler enough to make it into a generic method and now what i want to do is put an element on, on it I, I know that i can do that so copy that line again and now i want to take an element off the stack so i want to st have a string um, and i call it uh, uh, pop uh, uh, string is uh, it's called string stack dot pop no am I wrong I'm thinking at ahead this should be peak peaks so like that and again you see that the ID says this method doesn't yet exist and well be more consistent that would be nice also do that for my integer stack. 
just to go for sure, uh, yeah. the, the fact that Mr. Holmberg takes the two uh, type of specs is that the automatic method generation yeah. becomes a generic method. Uh, yeah. That's the yeah. only reason. Yeah, that is the reason why, why I want to do that. I want to make sure that uh, whatever the IDE tries to generate is of the proper type. Let's uh, see if that works. So if I click a light here, uh, one of these light, let's first save the file and then create a method peak. And now you see that it again does the wrong thing. That is a bit of a pity. It should have made this peak method into returning a T because the stack will contain T elements. And that is, uh, that is the idea. So the best implementation at the beginning to make sure that this test gets read and again, save the stuff and let's have it. Oh yeah, peak, peak, peak. Oh, this should be named differently. Uh, that is, um, now I must implement this method and the simplest implementation is, uh, well, return some kind of uh, reference and the default uh, nil is, is fine enough. So I made an, an implementation yet, but the, I know this is wrong. I only want to force my test to be read. So what I now do, assert that, uh, I look at the, at the string stack and I do a pop operation. Uh, no, I look at the, at the peaks value and I want it to be not nil. Yeah, is not nil. Yeah, that's the first thing because I want to, get, want to have my elements off. And also when I get it off, I want it to be equal to uh, in this case, hello, because that is what I've pushed onto the stack. So I do two tests here. The first test is nil, uh, nilness. It should not be nil. And the second test is when it's not nil, it should contain hello. Now to make this work, what we can do, uh, no, no, wrong. I should first run my test and you will see that the test fails in this instance because expected actual not to be nil. That is because this uh, current peak method simply returns the nil value. What do we need to do to improve that uh, peak method? Well, what we can do is we simply return the item that top points to. So we have this box with a reference to next, but also with the item, and that is the item of interest. And now we uh, run our test again. So we have a minimal implementation and now you see that we have a null pointer exception and that is on line 52. That is because this one, uh, why is that? That is because this one should comment out for a second, tries to dereference uh, an, a nil value because I haven't pushed anything onto that stack. So let's also copy this last line and put it in there. And then I should be able to uncomment this line. And then we will no longer have this null pointer exception. But you see that I again land at the end of this method because this already is correct. Yeah. So to show that again, return is nil like this. Yeah, so this test, this verification now says it shouldn't be nil. If I um, undo this change and uh, remove this line, I see that I hit this fail line. And uh, so that is, uh, that is now a, a test that is completely running to the end. And I can un uncomment that fail line and I have a green test. Yeah, now the next uh, operation on the stack is taking elements from the top and uh, taking the element of result of the top we already implemented because that is actually the, uh, the, the peak operation but removing is the next step so what we need to do is write a new test uh, pop, pop returns top and what we can do is the setup will be similar. So let's again copy that stuff, uh, copy and push it down like so. And then uh, we no longer want to do the peak operation, but a new method that we want to introduce into our stack. And that uh, operation will be uh, the pop operation. So 
Now we again have these bulbs, create a pop up uh, method in here. You see that it makes it into an integer because I clicked on the integer. And now as if I click this one, it also makes a string version. I don't want these both. I only want one and we know how to do that. Let's do that again. Click on one of them and make the return value of the proper type. Run the test. It will say not supported yet. So what we need to do before we can, ad can advance is implement this properly. But first also make a, an assertion. I only assert the, uh, the integer stack. Let's, yeah. Oops. So I in this case, I only like look at, um, at the uh, integer stack. So that would be the I, I S, let's call it integer stack and make this, oops, S S. Not so nice a name, but that's okay. And I want this integer stack to contain the value 42 because that is what I've pushed on all. So uh, run the test again. Now you will, it will not run into the fail anymore. It still says not supported yet. And now would you have to do the hard work of really coding this and coding this is first step is we want to be able to return the current element on the top, but that's easy. We call that thing that we want to return simply uh, a, a result. And we use the already available peak method for that. So now we have the current element. The next thing we need to do is hoist the elements up again. So we have, uh, we looked at the top element. We took the element, the item from it. We saved that, kept it in a separate uh, variable. And now we want to pull up stuff. We want to pull up the, the next element and put it on, on the top. Have the top element, the nail on which these chains are hanging, point to the new top elements by removing the thing in between. And that is real, really, really easy. Top equals top dot next. And then, of course, because this method is uh, returning a T, it insists on returning uh, the result. And that's easy enough. And now let's see if that works. Yeah, again, we have the failing test at the end. I'm in overdraft mode now already. And now we want to see, and that is the last test I will write, and that will, you will see that that test auto, almost automatically goes uh, correct. And that is that uh, a stack behaves as a first in, first out uh, thingy. So what I want is I want uh, an array of string uh, values equals uh, new string and then write i comma b oops comma c that is these are the elements that i want to push onto the stack so what i do is oops no wrong i want to i'm in a hurry that is never good for e I want these values. Why is this? That is because I'm missing something here. I need a string stack. Push it down. Sorry? I think you need curly braces in my uh, 86. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, right. Thank you. That is, yes. And then this one can go. No, it can't. You string. Why is this? Oh, the last one. Yeah. You see, I can't type. Well, we knew that. Uh, string stack, push the element on top of it. These are the, the elements from this values stuff. And now my assert that reads like, oh, I must take them off again. So what I will do is use the method is empty to to get all the elements from the stack again in a while loop and we know while loops while uh, string stack uh, is empty but then the inverse of that one yes uh, and i need a list to 
collect result. So this is a, a list of strings. The result is a new new array lists. Oops. That's it. Make sure that the imports are working. And then while the stack is not empty, string stack dot pop. Yes. And then the result dot add. That is what I do. I pop all the elements of the stack and I get them off in the uh, uh, last in first out order. So that is then the order that I expect and I put them in a list because then I can use a search J to inspect that result on containment contains exactly the values A, uh, sorry, B, C, comma, B and A in this exact order. And then I should be able to run this test and you see that this test stops at my line number 100. So the test is uh, this big. And if I now run it again, you will see that I have a complete stack. This is the stack itself. This is a helper class node. And you have also seen that this this the, the, the code that I wrote is almost minimal. I wrote no letter too much. I will avoid that because I can't type, you know that. But that is, that is uh, the general idea. The other thing is that the last thing I want to show, but then I'll stop, is if I set a configuration, which is provided by Sebipom, and then uh, run my tests. Uh, yes, show report and run my tests. And then look in what report uh, has been made by Maven. That is, uh, let's have a look. This, oh, wait a minute, sorry, sucks. This I should do all tests first. Now it says here, it says it didn't run any tests, don't bother. Inside here you find a report on a tool which is called Java, Jacoco, which is Java code coverage. And there you see an index file and you see that all the code that I've written is, is nicely covered by uh, all the tests I have. All the lines in my code have been covered. And also for the node, of course, the node stack is used. I only have methods inside the node stack that is used, like the constructor. That is the only thing that I really need. And that's, uh, that's it. So developing slowly in tiny steps, in a test-driven way, makes your code as minimal as possible because one of the rules that we have here is code that you didn't write can't be broken. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you next day. So wait a sec, wait a yes. sec. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> because, uh, okay, um, a few remarks that were made in the chat. Um, uh, someone was asking for the subversion client Yes. Um, actually, it is, it's integrated here, right? Yes. So in that is, is having a subversion client integrated. Yes. So you don't need to install it separately. Yep. Uh, and also use this one because this one knows which files to commit and which one not to do. Yep. Because if you have a separate subversion client, uh, then you need to uh, configure your ignore list, uh, the so-called ignore list. But you don't need to do that over here. So, so just do that uh, like this. And if you want to use it via the command line, I think you can also still use that. Um, um, uh, but, but avoid using Tortoise, especially for the uh, second year students. Don't do that. Get rid of it uh, because you will commit uh, a lot Junk. of junk. Now, what we, what we will do is we for will forbid uh, committing junk. The, then the subversion uh, server will simply not accept it. And because what is junk actually? Uh, so the, the, the compiled class uh, files, uh, the, the binaries, you shouldn't commit these to your repository. So uh, don't use those. Uh, uh, know what you do, actually. That is basically what uh, what is uh, the message. Mm -hmm. um, another thing was about the macros. Uh, they are called code templates. But yep. They are, I think, in the tips on the website. Yes. The, uh, how you can do it. Yes, that's true. Um, so that's fairly easy. Uh, yeah. but, but read uh, uh, read about it. Yes. 
Um, and then there were some remarks, I think, from second year students that repositories were not available, but we will have a look at it. That, uh, they, the, should, the, they should be available if uh, we know that you have to redo Java or PLC2. But if, yeah. if, if, if it isn't, uh, simply send us a mail, then we'll make sure that you have a, a repository. And yeah. Sebastian Wedekind also, oh, that, it's gone now. <laughs> Had his hand still raised, but it's gone now. Oh, yes, Sebastian. We can't hear you yet. You're still muted. Sebastian Wedekind is gone again. Okay. Yes? Yeah. And then the final remark, um, yeah, indeed, start uh, setting up the environment. Uh, last year we have had quite a lot of students who after three or four weeks still had uh, problems with their environment. So make sure it is correct uh, and avoid those spaces. Also avoid spaces in the uh, JDK um, uh, location where it is installed. Uh, so by default it is installed under program files for Windows users and that can uh, cause issues later on. So. Uh, make sure to get rid of it. Yeah. But install it under something like Java, C colon Java, whatever, or JDK, that's also a fine name. Yeah, that is good. That's yeah. a good, oh, those are good remarks. We'll, uh, we'll add that to the, to the website. That yeah. was it? Yes. Okay. Sebastian, you are still ha raising your hand. Is there a question? Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, my team cr er, crashed right uh, just in a moment. Oh, uh, that um, is, yeah. Yeah, when I tried to uh, get to with the subversion and just check out, there says uh, NetBeans subversion supporter requires a subversion client, and after uh, download it, you said that there was uh, something installed with NetBeans. Uh, okay. But there is no, right now, there is no, nothing. Uh, let's have a look. Um, let's have a look if we can find an available subversion client. So we can still see, we can't see your screen. Uh, you no, 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 uh, so you're, you're right. Uh, let's see if I can uh, find a subversion client, a sub SVN client. Um, that is, oh, uh, installed uh, subversion. That is, that is actually quite strange because the, my version brings it out of the box. I didn't install this separately, but it is a thing that uh, belongs to the base uh, IDE and it should be available it should be shown in uh in teams let's let's have a look i must first uh, yeah yeah something like that it should uh, it should do something like over here you should be able to select uh, uh, a new repository where is the thing i think it's in the preferences isn't it in the overall preferences of not these uh, not not quite sure that that would be options in this thingy uh, yeah. um, let's have a look. Uh, general, no. Miscellaneous, uh, CSV editor, no. Teams, no, 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 no. Java, Java. Ja yeah, that would be strange. It had that has nothing to do with uh, Java in particular. Maven, so yeah, so this is okay. about Maven. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I expected this uh, uh, subversion client to be integrated into the uh, NetBeans IDE. Um, I think it's it is, but uh, yeah. if you are not on my platform, it might be different. Well, we can have a look at it. We'll uh, we'll have a look at it, and we'll g give you uh, enough pointers to show you where you should be able to find stuff. Ah, ah, here it is. Team versioning, and you see over here that these are the available uh, versioning uh, things. And uh, it might be that it uh, it asks for um, um, a subversion client, and you might be actually might be right that um, that it doesn't work out of the box because I have a subversion client installed. Um, yeah, you will, uh, because, well, sub SVN is the command in this case, and NetBeans find that that is available, so it simply works out of the box. But if it doesn't, you must uh, install a subversion client, so your, the remark that NetBeans give you is uh, the correct one. The, the trick is to install Tortoise, so that is something we said you shouldn't, but Tortoise, but include the subversion client, and then ignore Tortoise, because the subversion client is the thing that you need. Or install the command line. Uh, or you install the uh, command line. Yes, of course, you can install the command line version. Let's have a look. Uh, Apache uh, subversion. 
that is where it comes from same as as maven and netbeans and whatnot and you should be able to get a binary package for windows just as fine as for uh, yeah here you go these are the subversion uh, the subversion things i'm not sure if there is a um, command line client but you can choose any of these um, we have good results with uh, tortoise but please uh, uh, install that, including the uh, subversion client. It is not offered by default, but uh, include that uh, that too. Then you will be able to work with the NetBeans just as well, and that keeps you keeps your uh, environment exactly the same as you're used to in your MOOC. The, the NetBeans is able to commit your stuff to the repository. You can get uh, the stuff from the repository using the way that uh, the ways that we showed you. Yeah. So that's uh, that's that. Any other questions? Then I would say uh, have a nice day. We'll publish the uh, video as soon as possible in Teams and maybe also on Net on uh, YouTube. But you'll uh, you'll find uh, a link at least inside the part one uh, group or channel, I should say, in Teams PLC two Teams uh, part one that will contain the video. Bye-bye.